Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar hosted by the Aral Food Institute at the University of Guelph. Today's topic is COVID-19 and the future of the culinary industry. I'm Stacia Elliott, Interim Associate Dean with the Gordon S. Lang School of Business uh, and Economics, and I'm also a professor in the School of Hospitality, Food and Tourism Management, where for the past 13 years or so, I've had opportunity to study and learn about um, the culinary industry, uh, among other things. So today I am the moderator of this panel of experts that we're bringing to you to bring a range of perspectives. And I'll introduce the panelists. And for the, about the first half hour of our time, I'll ask the panelists questions. But please, during that time, we invite your questions. So you can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen to send us questions. And then during the second half of our webinar, we'll address as many as, as we can during that time. So you can address them to a particular panelist or uh, to the group. Okay, our panelists. I'm so pleased we have two academics and two operators today, uh, which will give us a really nice range of perspectives. So first, we have Professor Maria Corradini, who is Errol Chair in Food Quality and Associate Professor in the Department of Food Science here at the University of Guelph. Hi, Maria. Next, we have James Eddington, who is Chef and Owner of Eddington's of Exeter in Huron County. Hi, James. Um, you're li suddenly we've you lost your son. There we go. There we go. <laughs> and next we have Bruce McAdams, who is Associate Professor in the School of Hospitality, Food and Tourism Management. Good morning, Bruce. And last but certainly not least, we have BJ Nair, who is our very own executive chef here at the University of Guelph. And Hi. we are known as Canada's Food University. So thank you, BJ, and to all our panelists for joining us today. Um, I'm going to start with the first question of our academics. So Bruce and Maria, from your respective disciplines, what has the research shown us about COVID-19 and the culinary industry? And is there some shifting ground or changes that you foresee? And maybe I'll start, I'll start with Bruce. Well, thanks, Stacia. Uh, you know, mid-March, like for everyone in the world, the uh, restaurant industry and food service changed um, very dramatically, and COVID-19 has had a huge impact on, on uh, an industry that employs 1.2 million Canadians across Canada. So that in itself just, I think, uh, sets the stage for how big an impact it has had. Um, Restaurants Canada, whose uh, body that represents food service in, in Canada, one of the bodies, came out with some data last week that that showed that uh, four out of five restaurants immediately uh, in, in March when the lockdown uh, protocol came into place had to lay off people. So, so right away you can see the impact on the workforce was, was huge. Uh, sadly as well, one, one out of 10 independent restaurants at that time closed their doors and, and closed their doors permanently. So, so right away there was a, a, you know, a decrease in the amount of restaurants um, we're going to reopen and, and more have, have decided to do that in the last two months. Um, the third thing that, I, that probably is, is most important for us right now is uh, a statistic that said seven out of 10 operators are, are seriously concerned with their ability to meet their cash flow requirements over the next three months. So that's their employees paying their vendors and, and paying their landlords. So. Um, you know, even though we are coming back to reopening and, and some places have um, been able to do takeout and, and patio service, et cetera, we're, we're still in a, a weak position um, as far as the, the industry. And, and really the industry, when we look at it, it, I'll break it into three parts. There's the, the contract food services, which BJ does, um, hospitality services, um, hospitals, retirement homes, stadiums. These places have been, some have been hit dramatically um, like stadiums, others like hospitals um, and retirement homes are still serving food and, and the same amount of food. They've just been hit by the protocols and, and, and the new procedures because of COVID and, and the health implications, obviously. Um, quick service has, has been hit the, the least probably because their model, and, and when we say quick service, um, McDonald's, Tim Horton, sort of the fast food of old. 
um, these these places uh, are built for takeout and delivery and drive through. So, so they've seen minimal sales uh, decline, and and they're sort of built for um, doing takeout and delivery. So, so they're the least impacted. The the area, the last big sector is full service dining, and that's the sit down dining. Um, restaurants and, and those that are the ones I worry about most. They're, they're the ones with least uh, financial backing behind them compared to the you know the larger um, contract food services and they're the ones that are really at the fabric of our, our communities and our, our you know interesting food systems. So th th those are the, that's the one that, that uh, I'm most worried about and uh, we'll probably speak to most during the webinar. Well, thank you for setting that somewhat scary stage of closures and layoffs and um, cash flow uh, disruptions. But this is this is our reality. So I appreciate that um, that beginning um, stage for us. Okay, so Maria, what's your take on the research and um, our shifting ground? Yeah. So from a food. Uh, from a food science perspective, uh, COVID cannot be considered a foodborne disease. Although the transmission through improperly handled foods cannot be discarded at this time based on the research that we have at hand. Uh, we have seen that the industry has responded with good food safety practices, for example, for all the takeout, uh, which should always be in place in any culinary and food service settings, um, and that uh, enhances our line of defense against uh, the virus while also reducing the risk of having actual foodborne diseases. In the case of the culinary industry, I see additional hurdles and risks that can come from transfer of the virus from surfaces, which is a very active um, uh, interest of research uh, currently. Uh, there has been some indications that uh, the virus can survive in specific services, although most of the research comes from medical uh, and now library uh, settings. Uh, but we know that, for example, paper, cardboard, plastic, and stainless steel can harbor the virus for a significant amount of time, depending on the conditions. So basically, um, additional and more stringent cleaning protocols will be here to stay at the restaurant front and back which may also slow operations and reduce the productivity of, of the restaurants and the food services themselves. Transmission is mainly from person to person, uh, so additional precautions also when interacting with customers are a necessary measure. Um, and for example, the use of protective wear, uh, gear, uh, and the cleaning uh, of that protective wear is also extremely active research at this point trying to provide uh, adequate uh, sanitation and disinfect disinfection techniques in order to facilitate uh, the reuse, for example, of PPE uh, is uh, extremely important, as well as additional care of the personnel, which I think that is an enhanced uh, to a certain extent to the, food, uh, to the food industry in general, taking better care of the people that are working in a food, in a food facility probably is a, a, a good addition at this point. So I'm, I'm encouraged that, that you identified that we, I, th I guess we started at a place of some good safety practices in our uh, restaurant and culinary operations. So that's, that's a positive. I'm an optimist. I'm going to hold on to that as a good, a good part of the story. Um, okay, so let's, let's move to our operators and hear your perspective. If you could give us maybe a little bit of background on how your operations have shifted in the past um, three months. And maybe we'll start with James. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, so the shift is a it has been a big shift. Obviously, we went from full service uh, dining room. Uh, we're a farm to table restaurant. So that's kind of changed. Uh, some of the help we had in the spring wasn't available. So we switched. We were lucky to spend the time actually working on the farm. We closed for a few weeks. But the shift was really, how do we do this? How do we do it right? Um, the safety protocols and doing that, obviously, we amp that up. We're already pretty confident in our in our health and safety measures at the restaurant, but we also, you try to double, triple that. And then you say, how do we do takeout? How do we survive as a business to keep staff employed? Um, 
to do it right. Uh, we actually took five weeks off and really thought about it, what we were going to do. And when we did open up for takeout, we had all the safety measures set up and we actually set an online ordering uh, system through Social Bar, a company out of Guelph, Kitchener, Waterloo area. So everything switched to online and doing that, we're going to relay that into our future of our business, but really took a proactive approach to say, how can we minimize contact? How can we do it that it's contactless payments? How do we do the traffic? How do we arrange the time? So the shift was, there's a lot of unknowns and things like I said, uh, Bruce was talking about, we weren't set up for fast food. We weren't in and out. We weren't, we were fine dining, right? So to switch that and then how do you do food that travels well? How do you do food that stays hot? How do you do environmentally friendly containers, right? So there was a big shift that way. So it was basically embracing the digital technology and changing the way we actually serve the product or the products that we serve so we can maintain quality. We may come back to that point of um, moving towards digitization as part of this, this shift that we're seeing, um, not just in culinary, but in many sectors as part of the, the pivot. Um, okay, so Vijay, let's hear from your very much different institutional um, setting, how you've shifted operations. Uh, yeah, so uh, we're in a, a sizable food service operation on, on campus. Uh, and like Bruce mentioned, uh, you know, it has affected uh, us very differently compared to uh, the mainstream uh, restaurants or, uh, or hotels. Uh, for our size, we have you know 22 different uh, outlets on campus, uh, five large volume locations, three big uh, production kitchens, uh, two foot, foot trucks, uh, full service catering and conference services. Right, 80% uh, of our revenue uh, is uh, for us is during the school year from uh, from middle of August till end of April, and uh, you know 60% of that is uh, typically meal plans and much of it is the 4,500 students uh, we have in residence. Uh, the other big aspect that we are dealing with is that you know, on a typical uh, school year, we have over 1,000 staff who work for us. Uh, we are one of the largest departments on campus, believe it or not. We have about 50 of us who work year round, uh, about 400 seasonal staff, and about 600 students who work uh, during the school year. Now, all that came to a screeching halt, just like everywhere else, middle of March, uh, and, and we really had to uh, shut everything down within, within the week of the announcement. Uh, it was one of our busiest school years, a very busy month for catering, as anyone on campus knows, it's March, uh, with all these special events and all the, all the award ceremonies and everything. And uh, we were actually getting ready for one of our busiest uh, uh, conference uh, summer. So, uh, uh, we were just left with uh, uh, having one single unit to cater for the few remaining international students who could not leave campus and the few remaining uh, staff uh, coming in. Uh, so uh, just like, you know, uh, bringing a big tank or truck or a big uh, ship to stop, it, uh, you know, it took us a couple of weeks to, uh, to kind of really slow down what we are going because we are going full steam. So to close down uh, 22 different outlets, all the food, uh, all, the, all the equipment, all the utensils, everything had to be washed, clean, frozen, packed, put away. It was quite a task with the few remaining staff, uh, you know, with, uh, and uh, with all the inventory and accounting and all that had to be taken care of as well. Uh, the, very soon though, you know, we discussed uh, among ourselves the possibility of uh, helping, uh, helping the community uh, because we are set up for that. Uh, so, uh, the seed came up for those of who are not from Guelph. Uh, the seed is a, is a local um, a non-profit organization that uh, delivers meals to the food uh, insecure. So we had a discussion with them through the uh, campus um, uh, community support group and we actually got cooking in, about two, uh, in a couple of days. So with a few remaining cooks on campus, we've actually done over 30,000 meals uh, so far uh, for, for the community. Uh, the other good thing that we've been, you know, uh, we've, we've done in the last uh, uh, couple of months is that, you know, we've had uh, time to focus on some of the projects that we've always had on our, on the back, uh, uh, on the back burner, if you may. Uh, we've been uh, working on our inventory system to tie it all up with our uh, menu management and uh, uh, recipes and nutrition management software, something that we've been, we've been working on for, uh, for a while. Uh, we have uh, you know, working on some equipment and, and, and stuff like that, equipment database and, and a host of other projects. So uh, 
you know, we, uh, a different scenario compared to what James goes through. So we, we you know, typically summers are not that busy, uh, uh, depending, on, depending on which, uh, what the conference season holds. So we've just taken, uh, taken over all the other projects to keep us, uh, keep us going and get ready for the fall. So. Very, very commendable, this pivot that you did to serve 30,000 meals uh, to those that are have food insecurities, um, BJ. Congratulations to you and your team. I think that's tremendous. Okay. Um, and again, I think it's something, maybe a little bit of the light that we've seen through COVID um, are these reaching out and doing good. Um, and uh, you know, if there's any similarity, although your operations are very different, I guess it's that during this time, operators on whatever scale are taking it to reflect on systems and um, what to do differently going forward. So, so let's talk about that because yes, things are, things are opening. We are moving towards uh, more and more openings every week, it seems. Um, so let, and this I'll ask of everyone, what, what do you see as the challenges to reopening and what needs to happen and how do we get there? And, and maybe I'll start with you, James, please. Um, some of the challenges, um, in, I, think, I think we still have to realize we're still under a state of emergency. I think once we do reopen, the general public kind of gets back into the routine. Uh, they start going out, storefronts start opening, restaurant patios start opening. I think that, that is my big concern is to realize that it's not normal. It's not going to be the same. We still have to ensure that we have the health and safety protocols in place and that and a lot of that is staff training and educating your guests right that's part of our process as we educate the guests the first thing they do we have disposable menus the first thing they get to see is what's new what are our rules and what we expect you as a guest so i think that's one of the challenges reopening but the challenge was i found when reopening was where do we get this information each health board each part of the province are doing things different. Each municipality has their own bylaws. That was one of my biggest challenges saying, when we do reopen, how do we do it? Are we doing it right? Are we doing it correctly? And like I said, then you start looking at best practices. The city of Stratford has done great things where their municipal staff are helping organize their patio structure in, in the town square, right? With municipal staff sanitizing, setting up tables, patio umbrellas. Whatnot. So there's all those little different infrastructure. How do we go ahead and expand our patio business? The Alcohol Gaming Commission was kind to give the province a blanket waiver to say you can do this, but then it still has to go to your municipal councils. Some are more proactive than others. So those were some of the challenges getting open, but I think realizing that, hey, we're still under state emergency and we have to really be careful and considerate in what we do. And one of my biggest concerns was, especially moving to takeout and moving to this new way, is we've worked so hard. Our goal five years ago is how do we become the most environmentally friendly we can be? How do we really implement this? So everything went to stainless steel, reusable this, reusable. Our menus, for example, we're printing off menus. We're saying cardboard at a certain type of uh, packing containers were at a sword shortage for a bit just because of the instant demand, right? So how do we do this with avoiding styrofoam, excess plastics, single use? So there's those challenges as well. Wow. Lots yeah. of, right? There's lots of, lots to think of, yeah. Layers, layers of challenges, but I, I really do appreciate that you mentioned the sustainability challenge on top of everything else. Yeah, um, I think that's important. So, yeah. so important not to, to, to lose that focus. Yeah, thank you. Um, Bruce. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a industry view again, and, and I'll start with a couple of different stakeholders. First of all, the, um, the consumers. Uh, again, data is showing right now that six out of 10 Canadians will feel comfortable dining out at a restaurant in the next three months. So, you know, that, that's the good news. Stacia, you're the optimist, but conversely, four out of 10 um, are not comfortable. And, uh, you know, a big part of that are people with underlying conditions, people, you know, at the higher end of the age scale, which, which tend to have a lot of disposable income. So, so I would echo what um, James is saying as well. You know, we're still in a state of emergency and, and this is, you know, there's some good news coming, but this is going to continue. From, from an employee, from a labor market point of view, this is, this is really, 
tricky situation for operators that I'm speaking to, uh, trying to get people to come back, first of all, where they're, you know, some are considering taking the summer off and enjoying their CERB um, payments and, and maybe coming back in the fall and rethinking what they're going to be doing. So th there's, there's an issue in, in many places on, on just bringing people back. And then there's the anxiety and stress of those workers coming back. So in, in operations in British Columbia, I'm speaking to, you know, the mental health of, of and, and the stress in the environments um, right now with having to worry about your health, worry about the health of your customers with all these new regulations. And as, as James and VJ can tell you, when you've been closed for three months, this is really a restaurant opening again. You're, you're retraining. You're, you're, yeah. Maria will tell you about all the new protocols they have to do. So, the, and operators don't have the money <laughs> to do all these things right now. They're cash strapped. So, so we're in a really, um, you know, especially for the full service restaurants, we're, we're, we're in a, uh, a, you know, a really tipping point, I believe. The one, you know, I, I think we'll get through it and, and, you know, operators um, are smart and, and resourceful. The one thing that we can't afford to happen is a setback to where we have to go and, and into lockdown again. That will be catastrophic um, for the industry. Uh, there'll be no recovering for many people in that case. And the other big thing is the is the 50 percent, um, you know, capacity restrictions. Um, full service restaurants, their financial model is based on two things: volume and certainty, knowing when people are coming because of of the labor involved. If a restaurant like James to do a million dollars employs 16 people, um, whereas in retail to do a million dollars in sales you employ six. Uh, in a gas station, it's 1.1. So we are incredibly labor intensive. Um, and, and for, you know, coming back at, at half capacity um, is, is a big challenge financially and, and, and probably not sustainable for many operations. Well, well, you may have dampened my optimism a little bit there, Bruce, <laughs> but maybe it all balances out. If only 60% of customers are coming back, but we're at 50% capacity, we're not going to um, uh, disappoint the customers that do come back, perhaps. I'll use that as a bit of optimism. And I promise to say something positive in, in before the end of the day. The next one? Okay, I'm going to hold you to that. Um, but, you know, we do need to be realistic, of course. Um, BJ. Yes, um, uh, you know, echoing what Bruce said, we, uh, we on campus are, are really not designed to be an operation preparing uh, food for anything less than a few thousand people every day. Uh, so it's, it's a complete switch around for us. Um, unlike uh, food operations in the, in the general consumer market, uh, you know, we have the last few, uh, few years of kind of focus and, and uh, uh, rely more and more on the students and staff on campus and even for the summers exclusively on, 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 on conferences and kind of have taken away, kind of gone away from weddings and other events in the last few years. And we do know, uh, you know, from listening to experts like Bruce and, and numerous other uh, our, our colleagues and uh, friends in other uh, uh, universities uh, that the new academic year will be significantly fewer customers and revenue. So. Uh, it is going to be very different uh, and, and quite difficult to operate for us. Uh, however, um, you know, in growth, we you know we, we carry you know more of a, uh, a responsibility for remaining one of the uh, key attractions on campus. And uh, we've always felt that you know we we just don't serve food. We we've played a critical role in uh, improving life on uh, on campus. So, like Stasha said, we are yeah we are optimistic that you know when the then the outbreak stimulus and, and uh, there's a great, you know, there's great success in stopping the spread. Uh, students will come back to campus and, uh, you know, and, and we are happy that, you know, we already have a substantial uh, inquiries already for conferences and, and, and events uh, uh, next summer. Uh, and uh, like uh, as I mentioned before, we do have a reopening committee on campus that is discussing plans and, and uh, directives for all of us. And once we have some idea of numbers and what are, what is uh, what is passed on to us. I think uh, and like um, Maria alluded to earlier, 
we have you know we have all these uh, protocols and and processes and everything written up and 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 we have operated enough on such a large scale that uh, you know we can we can switch into that and 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 get going uh, pretty pretty quickly. Uh, but like uh, Bruce mentioned, it's going to be it's going to be a reopening, and I think uh, for us, what the difference is that we have a huge amount of staff. You know, from people who work full time, from the people who work ten hours a week to five hours a week, one shift, four shifts. So, and for us, that's always been the challenge is to get everybody on the same on the same line, and 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 that takes uh, even on a regular operational day, it takes a lot of us and it takes a lot of effort for us to train, and with all this new new policies and procedures it's going to be more difficult again you know it, these are things that come our way and we we've always uh, dealt with it well so uh, uh, we should be okay and then uh, you know we also have to work with uh, we have uh, bargaining groups on campus for such a huge number of staff so we have to make sure we 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 work with them uh, you know uh, we, we we have to make sure we take care of our employees because they are on our they have always been one of our uh, major assets for for the department so we have to work well as to uh, in in any way, which is going to work well for the department, for the for the employees, and in 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 the end, it's it's a it's a it's a good solution for everybody. Uh, and we have other plans uh, drawn up as well. You know, operating at a 25% capacity, 50% capacity, or a 75% capacity. Which units will open? Which uh, shops are going to open? Which uh, you know, how many staff? So we've drawn up all those plans. We just have to know what the numbers will be, and then go from there. So. Thank you. Wow. Um, Maria, challenges from your perspective. Well, I think that as uh, Vijay well said, you know, there are different kinds of operations and every kind of operation has, will have different challenges. If there is an operation that has chosen to close for an extended period of time, of course, that is probably even worse than a reopening because you have a set operation with certain materials that probably you didn't have time to throw away or that you didn't have time to survey. So reopening is extremely challenging from the food safety perspective and a good survey of whatever is available, what can be um, still used and what should not be used is something that will contribute, of course, to food waste, but also it has to be done in order to uh, provide a, a, a reduction or, or a, of the risk of foodborne diseases. In the case of operations that kept on going, I think that the, uh, as James well mentioned, the, it was some time of introspection, which I think that is fantastic uh, in terms of setting protocols, uh, cleaning up protocols, um, and having a more structured way to approach, for example, disinfection in a very constant and consistent manner. Um, the changes in material and their impact on the operations and sustainability, I think that is a humongous challenge. And um, I was so proud to live in a city that was striving towards sustainability. And I could see how, they, how many of the operators have struggled in order to try to keep on doing things uh, with sustainability in mind, but also with the, uh, with the consumer safety in mind. Uh, I think that an additional challenge is going to come at the end of the summer season, of course, uh, with the fall and winter uh, coming onto us and having to move operations indoors. But, you know, I think that uh, during the last two months, there has been a lot of active research that will help to provide some glimpses of knowledge into the uncertainty that we are seeing and provide better guidance as James well said, you know, at the beginning it was very difficult to figure out what to do because we have very little information of what works. Now we are working towards providing that information. There has been a lot of projects at the university in order to try to provide a, a, the knowledge that we need in order to improve protocols and services. So I think that, you know, there, are, there is a balance of good and bad uh, and hopefully we can move forward and keep the good and the, the body is going to left behind once uh, we recover from this situation. Well, that's a good segue. Thank you, Maria, to the last question that I'd like to ask all the panelists. And that is about the silver lining, perhaps, and can we find any opportunities that might be part of the recovery effort? And um, let's start with Vijay. We're gonna we're gonna try and stay uh, optimistic about this as well. So, you know, campus dining has 
uh, already been uh, undergoing significant uh, changes based on the preferences of the generation Z, which is really our main main clientele. So, I think uh, uh, numerous surveys have shown us that you know uh, a sizable percentage of the restaurant goers and students going back to universities will cite. Uh, safe dining as the number one priority, and there's no question about that. So, we have been taking an investing step in, in investigating in changing the culture of our our staff and our group, which are which really hold the key for safe dining. Uh, so, the steps uh, that we have to take now to reopen is just going to make us better, and that's the way I, I, kind of uh, I would look at it. It's just going to be it's going to be a lot of effort, but I think it is just in the in the long run, it's just going to help us all make. Uh, be better, uh, better at that. Uh, we think, uh, you know, we have read all over that uh, transparent, it's, uh, transparency will be another important issue for students coming in. So uh, students will want to know where their food is coming from and, and how it was prepared. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the pandemic will intensify the demand for uh, complete dining uh, transparency as I think uh, students will uh, seek assurances that at no stage of the food preparation, uh, anything is going to put them at risk. Uh, and I think, again, that is one more thing that uh, will, we'll, uh, you know, we've all been striving to do that and at various levels. I think that is just going to make us uh, uh, work harder and, and make uh, that part of our process uh, better, I, I feel. Uh, again, uh, we are lucky to be on, 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 a, on a good campus. Uh, you know, uh, people are looking for uh, fresh and healthy and sustainable menus all the time. And I think uh, going forward, hope uh, you know, with the university community continuously pushing us and supporting for uh, such options that we have provided. I think, and that is one more thing that we think in the future, uh, when when our campus gets going, uh, we will see much more. Uh, 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 push and and, and 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 just help us drive our effort to that. Uh, one thing, though, uh, we feel is uh, the food insecurity due to the the deep uh, uh, economic impact. Uh, we have already been working with uh, certain uh, uh, groups on campus to address and help uh, help certain sections. I think with uh, with the pandemic, there's going to be a sizable need uh, on campus and in our community for uh, uh, people. Uh, People who need help with food. So, uh, I think we will look at it as this challenge and maybe an an, an, an opportunity to be opportunity to be part you know, of the discussion and maybe drive for uh, solutions as well as as the university community. I think that is um, uh, definitely one thing that we might, we want to be more invested in. And just like everyone else, you uh, remind you know, me uh, the importance of uh, our food and culinary industry in whole healthy communities. Um, yep. Who's next on my list? Sorry, Maria. Uh, yeah, I think that Stacia froze on us. Um, so I think that, as I was mentioning before, all these enhanced protocols and disinfection uh, is going to be only good news for the foodborne diseases that actually happens and are uh, a constant a threat to the industry and to the reputation of the restaurant businesses and food services. And so I think that that's going to uh, be um, significantly reduced uh, and there are some indications that that is the case. Uh, I think that also having more streamlined protocols can move to other parts of the operation. And people have been taking time, as Shane has said, in order to um, think about their operations and how they can be, um, how they can be better uh, performed. So, uh, in terms of providing uh, security and safety to um, to others, uh, I think that that can move to other parts of the operation and increase a little bit of um, the productivity and reduce inefficiencies uh, and food waste in a similar manner. Um, uh, so, I think that those are probably the best uh, outcomes uh, that we can think about uh, this situation. Bruce, I think that is your time to provide us with the sure. silver lining. I, thank you, Maria. I will, uh, I will go. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I hesitate to use the term silver lining uh, because it has been such a catastrophic um, event. Um, but there is, you know, good things will, will 
and for our industry, like you just mentioned, in the next year or two because of this um, COVID. And everyone on the panel today has, has already mentioned the benefit of this time to pause and reflect and have some time. James, you said you shut down for five weeks. VJ, you're re-looking at things. Maria, you said everyone's, you know, looking through their, their systems. So, so, you know, there's, there's lots of good that, that can come out of that. For me, the most interesting thing has been a, a really progressive voice that has emerged the last month or two from um, many operators that are talking about a new business model in restaurants. So they're talking about a new approach to pricing. Um, demand-based pricing, revenue management and pricing, things that we have typically not done in the industry. Um, they're talking about living wages for employees and benefits and, and more equity in the distribution of, of the wage pie amongst our, our employees. Um, they're talking about prevent professionalism and trying to move away from uh, a transient nature of our business where people are coming and going to to make it an industry where people are are proud and 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 it's a profession and they want to stay um, in the industry so there's lots of lots of uh, wonderful um, things that are happening you know and, and and I have to tip my hat to to James and VJ who are both chefs you know the chefs uh, seem to be driving a lot of this discussion um, you know many people like Amanda Cohen um, you know, can, arguably Canada's most famous chef who, who now works in um, New York, but she said if she, it would be a disappointment to her and she won't allow her, her restaurant to reopen under the same business um, that it was when it closed. So um, I think, I think uh, you know, the, this sort of movement will be organic as, as independent restaurants in particular experiment and, and um, with different, uh, different things. And I pass it over to you next, VJ. I think. Oh, I'm up next. I'll, uh, Sorry, James. Yeah, it's okay, Bruce. Um, yeah, actually, I'm very excited. I'm gonna, I'm gonna echo BJ. I'm very excited about the farm to table. I've always been a true activist of the farm to table movement, uh, knowing where your food co food comes from, sh su supporting local uh, farmers, su supporting the local agricultural chain. Right. So to me, I'm actually very excited that more people will be on board with this. So, and I think. Um, organizations which have been very helpful to me, especially in the past three months when it has become a pandemic, the Culinary Tourism Alliance, the Feast On Certification Program, having those in place and actually having that reputable backing behind those restaurants that can be Feast On certified, supporting Ontario, supporting local food. I think that's a great silver lining in the whole culinary world right now. Um, the second thing is actually customers are, I think the last five years, I've been in business now 23 years, uh, five, the last five years, it's been more demand of what the customers want, what's this, people are more acceptable. This is local, this is fresh, this is available now. People are acceptable to change the reservation time so that we do, even the patio the first week of being open, we staggered that everybody was a 15 minutes apart when they came in so that the traffic wasn't going through the restaurant or through the patio at the same time, right? People are very understanding. So I think those are silver linings. The customers are getting it and understanding it. And then the local food and having programs like the Feast On Certification Program, the Culinary Tourism Alliance to work with organizations like that. I think those are great opportunities for the future. I think I'm gonna um, take over as moderator now and I'm gonna open um, it up to questions. So bear with me as I as I read the questions from our our, our uh, participants, and then um, I'm going to put forth to the panel, and you guys can um, uh, can take a take a stab at answering these. So let me get to the first the first question here that I'm going to pick. Um, have operations been having challenges to identify and obtain proper protective personal equipment in cleaning, sanitizing supplies at a reasonable price? So great question. It, it uh, may be VJ and James from your experience and, and Maria, obviously someone can, can take that question on. I'll go ahead. You go first, James. Yeah. Yeah, actually uh, the, the bond between other restaurants and other Lo the local grocery store, the local restaurants, the other local businesses, I found has been stronger than ever. So we as a team mutually in South Huron and in the extra region kind of sourced out our local independent culture. I know they were already doing that. The owner helped us get extra sanitizer. Um, the local 
the office solution store that would we would get all our we would get all our office supplies from was very proactive in saying here's some PPEs, here's some face shields, here's some masks, here's all the equipment you need, here's sanitizers for your debit machines that are that are proactive for that. So as a community, we worked really well together to not be, it, it was difficult. Some of the things were shorted and those who purchased early, I think had, had to jump on it as limited supplies, but as a community, um, the local charity groups were making masks for everybody. They made over a thousand masks for people in the industry or people that were still working at the grocery store or, or restaurants when they opened back up for takeout. So there's a lot of, there has been a community support to make sure that we all have our PPEs and our sanitization. So that's been very good. I'm back. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Part of the whole experience we're all going through. My apologies. Did anybody else want to address that one or do you want to go on to another question from our participants? I think that it was an interesting opportunity also for training on the use of PPE. And so I think that, for example, the correct use of gloves, it's something that came onto our attention and it was uh, very well received and uh, how, for example, hand sanitation was uh, or trumps, you know, the, the bad use of a glove. So I think that that's something that uh, is interesting from, from that point of view. But yeah, I think that it has been shortages and I'm glad that most of the communities has worked together in order to channel uh, appropriate PPE to people that need it in order to continue their operations. Uh, we are lucky that because because we run such a big operation, we 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 already had a little bit of resources in all the units, uh, you know, sanitizers, and uh, we had uh, masks in our uh, bookstore and stuff like that to get us going initially. But even for us, it it in in in, in, in the first part, it was a little tough to get hold of uh, uh, get hold of uh, sanitizers because we were also on the backlog of trying to get all these things. But uh, as soon as supply, as soon as the healthcare and everybody else got their fair share, I think um, uh, because we also are tied up with a few franchises like Importance and stuff like that, uh, you know, we got a few things through them. And you know, um, our couple of our managers were very resourceful. They started making masks for the OVC, for Kitchener in general. And then we got a uh, supply of uh, PP, uh, from, uh, face masks from, uh, from that as well. So, uh, it was difficult initially, but now I think uh, with the supplies, uh, slowly getting back to at least some sort of normalcy, we, we have, uh, and, uh, we are trying to uh, stock up as well for, for uh, the future operation. And I think it is going to be the normal for quite some time. Stacia, I, I may add from a, a consumer perspective about PPE, and, and I'm part of a research group looking at sustainability. Uh, sustainability initiatives in restaurants during this um, uh, pandemic. And, and one of the things that was brought up at our meeting yesterday from operators is the amount of, of guests that are now using um, online reviews like TripAdvisor and mentioning um, the adherence to um, practices like wearing masks and having sanitizer available. And, and just anecdotally, I went through about 20 um, out in BC restaurant reviews and, and almost all of them mentioned uh, adherence or the practices that were, were being um, uh, applied in, in the restaurants. So from a consumer point of view, um, it's a big deal as well. Very good point. Thank you. Um, this one I might ask of you, James, and thank you. We're getting a lot of questions in, which is great. Have you felt supply chain changes and will you make different purchasing decisions in the future? Absolutely. Um, supply chain has, there has been a limit. Um, if I think if anybody follows the markets, beef, pork, chicken have all increased in price dramatically. Shortages on pork, example, um, even in the, if you look at the grocery store, we had farms that have lost 600 acres of asparagus, right? So shortage in the market, in the province, right? So you see some local things because they didn't have the farm help or the workers or cases of COVID that they couldn't get the agriculture that we needed or the food that we needed. Um, 
I think the market is starting to get a little bit more stable now. I know pork prices are coming back down. Beef prices are still escalated. Um, talking with the caucus, with the Minister of Tourism, and actually saying the supply chain, how is this working? I know provincially, I think they're trying to make sure that the grocery stores are well stocked and that their prices are more consistent so that, that the general public will still be fed and do that fairly and equitably for everybody, while restaurants and banquet centers and whatnot might have some inflated pricing through their suppliers just as a term because their supply is limited as well. So there's definitely a supply issues, but that's going back to having a little bit of control back in that we can very well confidently say to the customers, sorry, our menu is subject to change. It's upon seasonable availability, right? So for example, we try to, our fishermen like here on fish, it could be pickerel today, it could be perch tomorrow. It depends what they catch. We're not gonna do a consistent it's going to be what is fresh, what is local, and what is available. Well, um, maybe even more sustainable with a surprise. <laughs> I mean, that makes me happy. That's the silver lining that we're actually. Yeah, that's a wonderful silver lining. Thank yeah. you. You know, I like those silver linings. Yeah. Um, DJ, what about at the institutional level? I can imagine there's been supply chain issues for you. Yeah, so the, the difference is that uh, we, we, are, we are just cooking for uh, the seed at this point of time. Uh, so we pretty much uh, uh, work with what uh, the seed gets the donations and uh, we kind of substitute with what we have in our freezers or uh, uh, stores very minimal. So when we get back into full operation though, I think it'll be a, a, be a different story, uh, but the one thing we know for sure is that uh, we are not going back to our uh, going back into a full operation like we typically do in in September. Uh, we you know we've had this discussion with uh, my uh, good friends and colleagues at uh, the University of uh, uh, Waterloo and uh, McMaster University. We are kind of fairly typically uh, similar sized operations, all within a within a, a forty to forty five kilometer um, uh, radius, if you may. Uh, I think. It'll definitely affect us with uh, some of the things that we will have to uh, source in the fall. But uh, you know, uh, over the few years, I think we have uh, we have been changing the way we work on campus with our menus. Uh, we are kind of focused on what is available, and then we decide on 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 menus that way. So we have kind of a like a different way of working. But you know, there are a few other staples that uh, you know we we have to we have you know for such a huge operation, there is no other way. But you know, there are things like uh, you know you know as uh, as much as I don't like to say, you know, like is it fried chicken or you know whatever for some of the franchises, uh, we do get those through the franchises. But there are a lot of other things. I think we will get uh, we'll have to be more uh, resourceful uh, in the future. There's another quite interesting question here. What could new municipalities be doing to better support restaurants at this time? Bruce, could I maybe put you on the spot for this one? Sure. You know, all levels of government are, are in play here, which, um, you know, federal with, with wage subsidies, uh, with CERB, with, you know, the rent, um, uh, that they're trying to get uh, rent breaks for, sorry, for the, um, uh, the restaurants. You know, Ontario and, and provincial governments are, are uh, you know, controlling what's opening and when they're opening, et cetera. And municipalities as well have, have stepped up. I think probably the, you know, uh, John Tory in Toronto did their patio plan two weeks ago, which was really saying, okay, we're, we're priming and getting ready and, and allowing you to expand your um, footprint during these uh, during these half openings where you have capacity limits, um, and as well, I think um, not to be understated, and it's not municipal, but James mentioned the Alcohol and Gaming Commission, Commission which is notorious um, for you know changing anything, and and uh, in Ontario at least, it's it's really opened up, and they're being very. Um, very supportive of, uh, of businesses. Maria might want to con uh, speak to the um, health departments, which are, are municipal. Uh, she may want to say something about that. Yeah, I think that the health departments are getting a lot of interesting information worldwide and trying to channel it properly. 
uh, to uh, the federal uh, at the federal and municipal uh, and provincial levels. Uh, I think that uh, from the beginning to the shutdown till now, uh, you have seen uh, we have seen an increase um, and a better communication channels and uh, to a certain extent more streamlined uh, information that we have been seeing at the beginning. Uh, I think that uh, as we are creating uh, or, or we are discovering uh, additional stuff, um, keeping an open channel between uh, research institutions and uh, policymakers is key in order to convey the information at the right place in the right form. Uh, so I think that uh, there is a still a, a lot to do, but has been improving so far. Uh, and I think that trying to keep the communication clear uh, and uh, consistent as much as possible uh, is one of the key uh, points that has to be emphasized here. Excellent, thank you. Okay, we've got a really specific offer here. Um, I'll just read it. It says, are you open to collaborating with a Toronto group on a social lab in a pilot target area, rediscovery of holistic sustainable food solutions using a circular economic framework? So you can answer if you're interested, but, but maybe I'll start with you, James, and just ask about this, this concept of collaboration. And if you see directions in our future that will be calling on more collaboration in the culinary space. I think collaboration is the key to the success and to the future of this whole industry. I think it's with every industry, but I think collaboration having, like I, like I mentioned before the Feast On program, having, having industry leaders and groups that we can be part of and work together with. I think when we go back to the municipalities and the government, the collaboration between the governments and between the different organizations, I think that is essential. And I think that's something we're gonna learn from. And I think provincially we will learn from and municipally we will learn from and saying, the province said open, the municipalities didn't really have any guidelines. Some of order of the house were different. I think if we ever get into the situation again or moving forward, I think we're going to learn from that, the collaboration to say, hey, we're all going to work together. We're gonna to be, and like Maria said, consistency, clear and concise, right these are this is this is the protocol this is what we do and this is how we're doing it and i think that collaboration will be great and if this ever if we're ever back in the situation again i hope not i really do but uh if we are i hope then it's a it's a clear and concise manner and we're collaborated that way but industry groups i think that's i think as an industry i think it will be stronger than ever i've actually talked to more restaurateurs and people that before we we're lucky we've never really considered we've been colleagues not competition but the the colleagues have grown the the outreach of a phone call at nine o'clock at night saying hey we're just opening our patio to what do we do what is the best protocol how did you ensure that your customers are safe and we work together as one big team so the industry as a whole i think has really came together thank you anyone else like to add a point or i'm going to start to wrap up collaboration just unmute if you'd like yep yeah uh, you know i i think these grassroots collaborative efforts are amazing and they're fantastic and they've helped move us along but i i think we also have to look at government and and uh the government needs to step in and be more involved you know the the first time i've heard the word used was about three weeks ago um, when they said the circular restaurant, and then that was the Sustainable Restaurant Association in, out of Britain and the UK. And, you know, we've heard about the circular economy in Guelph. It's amazing what's being done. But I think, um, you know, local grassroots organic collaboration is great, but, but we're at a point in time where we, it needs to move quicker and we, we can't just um, rely on, on small initiatives to prove points and then, you know, fruit to bear in five years. I, I really believe that we need, um, we need governments to, to reflect on this, this point in time and, and, and to step up and get involved and collaborate as well more. Thank you, anyone else? Okay, here's how I'd like to end this. I've, I've taken some notes of 
key concepts, if you will, that I think are going to influence the future of our culinary industry going forward. They're just one word. So I'm going to read my short list and then I'm going to go around and challenge you for a word or two that you see that I've missed on my list that's important that we think about as we go forward. So here's what I've captured from today. Reflection, transparency, well-being, local, sustainable, and collaborative. What else? And just go off mute if you've got something. I think the knowledge. Knowledge. Multi-stakeholder, that's two words, but I'm Okay. <laughs> James? I echo all of those, I think that, yeah. And VJ? Yeah, uh, safety is one, uh, and safety. definitely, uh, uh, I think it kind of relates to what Maria said, uh, education and awareness, and that's very key. Yeah. I think I'm going to add one more station, that's immediacy, or you could mm. do urgency, um, and, and that goes beyond the, the pandemic that we're dealing with to the change in our climate, as well as the inequities mm -hmm. that are, are you know, systemic in our, our society. So I think there's, um, I think there's, there's action, immediacy, urgency, it's time to change. I'm going to say compassion is my word, my word, compassion. I think understanding with our staff and with our customers and with, with all these changes and all the, what we're all dealing with, I think compassion amongst our fellow, our fellow people. I think that's important still. Wow, that's great. Well, I'll end it there. That's a good note to end on. And um, I want to start with a big thanks to our Aerial Food Institute team, Muriel O'Doherty, Colleen Hennon, and Maggie McCormick, our behind the scenes team who have made this whole series happen. Um, I also want to thank all the participants out there. Really appreciate your questions and your engagement today. And of course, I want to thank our wonderful panel of Maria, Vijay, and Bruce, and James for being part of this. Thank you very much. This has been recorded. And, um, and so if you go to the AFI website, you'll be able to see the link if you want to rewatch or share. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day, everyone.